Howdy there, mother factors. Uh, Language. No cap, I said mother factors. That's what these guys are called and yeah, never mind. Welcome to this edition of 101 Facts. I'm Sam and I'm here to talk to you today about just a kid from Brooklyn who's a poster boy for Americans everywhere and whose bulky bod has inspired people all over the world. No, it's not Lou Ferrigno. I'm talking Captain America. But why was his greatest enemy nearly hot fudge? Why, for a brief period, did he fear full moons? How much does Cap love fondue? Two out of three of those questions are about to be answered. So grab your shield and jump out of the nearest plane with gay abandon and go and save the mother effing planet. This is 101 Facts about Captain America. Number one. FYI, I see why am I, Captain America's real name is Steve Rogers. Steve was once a scrawny little fine art student during the Great Depression, who lost his parents early in his life because apparently you can't be a superhero with a living mummy and daddy. Number two. In the early 1940s during World War II, Steve attempted to enlist in the army, but he failed to pass the physical requirements and was therefore asked to volunteer for Operation Rebirth. Number three. Operation Rebirth wasn't a particularly mediocre thrash metal band, although that's exactly what it sounds like. It was a project intended to enhance US soldiers to the height of physical perfection. Rogers was the first subject and was injected with a super soldier serum. Ooh, looks yummy. Number four. After being exposed to a burst of Vita rays, he burst out of his cocoon like a beautiful kappa fly looking all buff and stuff and taking up the mantle of Captain America to go kick some Nazi bottom. Number five. Captain America has no superpowers as such. He can't fly, can't walk through walls, or rap Nicki Minaj's verse on the song Monster word for word. But he's at peak physical human condition, meaning he can do an awful lot of stuff. Number six. For instance, he can bench press 1,200 pounds and run a mile in 73 seconds, which is almost as much as me. Number seven. His strength, endurance, agility, speed, fashion sense, reflexes, durability, healing, and frisbee skills are above natural human potential. As a small weakness though, he does have some eczema, mainly on his feet. Number eight. Cap came in at 6th place on IGN's Top 100 Comic Book Heroes of All Time in 2011 and 2nd in their Top 25 Best Marvel Superheroes list in 2014. Number 9. Like most of Marvel's most iconic heroes, you might think that Cap was co-created by geek deity Stan Lee. However, you're about as incorrect as Steve Harvey at a beauty pageant. Number 10. In fact, it was a couple of chaps called Joe Simon and Jack Kirby who, in 1940, cooked him up as their response to World War II. Number 11. Simon and Kirby, not that Kirby, wanted to create a character with a strong political slant who emphasised their feelings as to why the US should get involved with the war. Number 12. When Simon drew the original sketch of the character, he named it Super American. He quickly decided against that after discovering there were too many super characters already in publication. And let's face it, that sounds a little bit silly. Number 13. After some push, 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 but more of the pencils than the normal kind of pushing, Captain America was born and he debuted in his own comic in December 1940. Number 14. The comic started strong, with the front cover being Captain America punching Hitler in the face. Which is exactly how I wanted to start this video, but Clive didn't want to dress up as Hitler. Again. Number 15! The comic quickly sold over a million copies, but this spawned protests against the pro-war sentiments that the comic stood for. Number 16! The comic was so controversial that the offices of Timely Comics received police protection from the Mayor of New York. Number 17! In 1941, Simon and Kirby moved to DC Comics, having produced Captain America comics through to issue 10. Number 18. In 1966, Joe Simon sued the owners of Marvel Comics, asserting that he, not Marvel, was legally entitled to renew the copyright upon the expiration of the original 28-year term. Number 19. The two parties settled out of court, with Simon agreeing to a statement that the character had been created under terms of employment by the publisher, and therefore it was work for hire owned by them. 
Number 20. After eight years of publications, superhero comics went out of fashion and the comic was turned into a horror suspense anthology before finally packing it in. But something tells me it came back. Number 21. It did come back. But before Cap made his official return, audiences were treated to him appearing in a 1963 issue of Strange Tales. He was alongside the Human Torch, and it was to test whether or not audiences would want to see Captain America back again. I wonder if he got deja vu. <laughs> Number 22. When the character was at the height of his popularity, a black and white 1944 serial, no, no, not that kind of serial, was released. Starring Dick Purcell as Captain America and Lorna Gray as his secretary, Gail Richards. Number 23. In the serial, the captain had his defining traits taken away from him, such as his shield, super soldier serum, and his original identity of Steve Rogers. Instead, he was a district attorney named Grant Gardner. Number 24. In it, he fought against a baddie named the Scarab, who was trying to get his hands on some powerful weapons, such as the, uh, <laughs> dynamic vibrator. <laughs> he could have just got one of those from Ann Summers. I understood that reference. I bet you did, Cap, you dirty dog. Number 25. Captain Steve soon became Timely's most popular character, and even had a fan club named the Sentinels of Liberty, which is probably the most American thing I've ever heard in my life. Number 26. I kind of owe you an apology. Way back in Fact 9, I mentioned that Stan Lee didn't create Cap, but he kind of did. Well, as we know him today, anyway. It was Lee who brought him back in the early 60s as a member of the Avengers. Number 27. Captain America wasn't actually in the Avengers originally. The original members were Iron Man, Ant-Man, Wasp, Hulk, and Thor. Old CA was added in to replace the Hulk who was too uncontrollable. Oh, poor Hulk. Number 28. Captain America was formally reintroduced in the Avengers number 4 in March 1964. Yes, hello to you too, Cap. Which explained that in the final days of World War II, he had fallen from an experimental drone plane into the North Atlantic Ocean and spent decades as a capsicle in a state of suspended animation. Number 29! Following the success of the other Marvel characters introduced in the 1960s, Captain America was recast as a hero who was haunted by his past memories and trying to adapt to 1960s society. Number 30! Over the years, Steve Rogers has, in various ways, lost his mojo. I've lost my mojo! Oh no, sorry, that was, that was someone else. What I meant to say was that he lost his super soldier serum inside his body in a number of weird ways. This usually turns him into a frail version of his former self or into an elderly man with no powers, the poor old sausage. Num the 31. Stan Lee contributed to the character in issue 3 in the filler text story Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge, which introduced the character's use of his shield as a returning throwable weapon. Number 32. The secrets of creating the super soldier serum were lost with the death of its creator, Dr. Abraham Erskine. In the decades following, there have been numerous attempts to recreate Erskine's treatment, only to have them end in failures. Sad face. Number 33. Even worse, the attempts have instead often created psychopathic villains, such as Nuke, who is so patriotic he has the American flag tattooed to his face. Ouchies. Number 34. He's regarded as one of the best hand-to-hand -hand combatants in the Marvel Universe, and has blended judo, western boxing, kickboxing, foxy boxing, and gymnastics into his unique fighting style. Number 35. Captain America is one of the few mortal beings who is deemed worthy enough to wield Thor's mighty hammer in his hands. Stop laughing at the back, not like that. Number 36. He's actually lifted the hammer twice. First, when under the alias of the Captain, he and the Avengers fought the Egyptian god of death, Seth, weird name for a god, when Thor was KO'd in the battle. After killing Seth, Rogers returned the hammer to Thor, who was, it's fair to say, a bit baffled by the whole thing. Number 37. The second time was in the Fear Itself storyline. Cap's shield had already been shattered in the fight, so Cap took up the hammer and used it to defeat the baddies. Number 38. His number one choice of thing to hit people with is his shield, 
A concave disc, two and a half feet in diameter, weighing 12 pounds. Number 39. Originally, he carried a steel shield, which resembled the traditional shield found in the seal of the United States because he's so ruddy patriotic. Number 40. This is apparently the noise it makes. <laughs> Number 41. Because he's such a nice man, he gave this triangular shield to King T'Chaka of the African nation Wakanda. AKA Black Panther's daddy. The meaning of life. The most recognizable shield was an almost indestructible CD-ROM shaped shield made from an experimental alloy of steel and the fictional metal and weird adult toy sound alike, vibranium. Number four to three. The shield was created by American metallurgist, Dr. Myron McLean, who was contracted by the US government to create an impenetrable substance to use for tanks during World War II. Number 44. The alloy was created by accident while McLean was asleep, the slumbering idiot, and it was never duplicated. Although efforts to reverse engineer it resulted in the discovery of adamantium, which is the metal that stuck to Wolverine's skeleton. Number 45. When he's without his shield, Captain America first wipes his tears away and then uses other shields made from less durable materials such as steel or even a fancy la -dee da photonic energy shield. Fancy? Number 46. Even though it looks all shiny and pretty, the shield has been damaged and even destroyed, despite the fact it's technically indestructible. Because, well, comics. The shield was once dented by an enraged Odin Force-powered Thor using Mjolnir, but he later reconciled and pounded out the dent. What a nice guy. Number 47. His uniform is made from a material that's fire retardant. Hey, can we, can we say that word? It sounds very offensive. Anyway, he also wears a lightweight bulletproof Duralumin scale armor beneath his uniform for added protection, much like I do. Number 48. Originally, Roger's mask was a separate piece of material, but an early engagement had it dislodged, almost exposing his identity. Gosh, I really hope that doesn't happen to me. Oh, God damn it. Number 49. To prevent this happening again, Rogers modified the mask with the connecting material to his uniform, an added benefit of which was extending the armor to cover his previously exposed neck. Number 50. Tony Stark, who provides equipment for all the Avengers except for Thor, had strong electromagnetic panels placed on each of Cap's gloves to allow Steve to retrieve his shield more easily. God, that must have been a nightmare if you ever went near a fridge. Hey, maybe that's his weapon in Civil War. You were working as a waitress in a number 51. Many of Cap's enemies embody ideals contrary to the American values that he's shown to strive for and believe in with his red, white and blue blood. For a start, there's those nefarious little, and I'm going to say this word, bastards, Hydra. Number 52. Hydra is a neo-Nazi fascist organization dedicated to world domination. Wow, I've never heard so many evil words in one sentence. They've featured a number of times in various Marvel universes in these fetching green and yellow uniforms. Sexy. Number 53. Baron von Strucker is one of Cap's many Nazi enemies. He first appeared in 1964's Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos number 5, and eventually led Hydra. He's also appeared in Avengers Age of Ultron, though his performance was shorter than Quicksilver's stint as Hawkeye's bodyguard. Too soon? Too soon. Number 54. Batroc the Leaper is one of the more ridiculous recurring foes who first appeared in Tales of Suspense number 75. He's a mercenary and a master of savant, the art of French foot fighting. Basically, he's good at kicking things. He also appeared in the 2014 movie The Winter Soldier, where he, uh, kicked things. Number 55. One of the most evil and deadly enemies ever and the worst possible outcome of the sentence hot redhead in your area, Red Skull is considered to be the Nazi equivalent of Captain America. Number 56. Originally, he was inspired by something that all great villains are born from, desserts. Artist and writer Joe Simon was looking for a cap nemesis and noticed that the fudge on his ice cream was melting, looking like a deformed person. He was originally going to name Red Skull Hot Fudge for this reason. Number 57. In recent years, the skull stole the brain of Professor Charles Xavier of the X-Men and used his genetic tissue to give himself Xavier's psychic powers. 
This allowed Red Skull to rule the world. Let's try and keep him away from Professor X, shall we? Uh, has anyone seen James McAvoy around? Number 58. Crossbones is a disciple of the Red Skull who was responsible for assembling the Skeleton Crew, which isn't a 90s hip-hop revival group, but is actually a team of neo-Nazi villains dedicated to the Skull's teachings. Number 59. Crossbones appeared in the Winter Soldier movie as his alter ego Brock Rumlow, and will assume his identity Crossbones in Captain America Civil War. Number 60. Tony Stark is one of Cap's oldest allies, and the man who pulled him from the ice where he was frozen since World War II. However, the Civil War storyline saw the two go against each other. Ooh. Number 61. See, this is them fighting. <laughs> Solid dick. Number 62. They have a bit of a lover's tiff over a piece of legislation called the Superhuman Registration Act, with Tony voting for superheroes being registered in a government database, and Steve saying, uh-uh, no way, girlfriend. Actual quote. Number 63. In the comic books, this ended with Cap surrendering, an act that allowed Crossbones to assassinate him with a big gun. Tony and Steve will go at it again, not like that, in the 2016 Civil War movie. Nintendo 64. Cap's best friend in the world, James Buchanan f***y... Oh, sorry, misread that. Bucky Barnes was created by Simon Kirby and first appeared in the Captain America comics number one. Number 65. Captain America's actual girlfriend, Betsy Ross, then took his place by Cap's side and became the superhero Golden Girl. Number 66. In 2005, Bucky was brought back from supposed death near the end of World War II. Number 67. Bucky was revived and suffered from brain damage and amnesia, as well as a missing arm, which must have been very inconvenient. He was given a bionic arm and programmed in Department X, a Soviet agency used to brainwash him and convert ops missions. Sorry, I'm not sure why I did that voice there. Number 68. His new code name was The Winter Soldier, which is a bit of a coincidence, as there's a Captain America movie subtitled The Winter Soldier. Hmm. Number 69. Back in 1985, there were plans to create a Captain America musical on Broadway. It was intended to follow Steve Rogers as he went through a midlife crisis. Thank Christ, it never went ahead. Number 70. In the comics, during a battle with a villain known as Nightshade, Captain America was injected with a serum which turned him into a werewolf. Oh, don't you just hate it when that happens? He became known as Capwolf and remained this way for a few issues before being cured and returning to his former human self. Number 71. During his Catwolf phase, he came into contact with Wolverine. Catwolf 1, by the way, before you start betting with your friends. Number 72. After Cap's comics grew in popularity, MLJ Magazines, also known as Archie Comics, made a complaint that the character's then triangular shield too closely resembled the chest symbol of their shield character. This led to the shape of Cap's shield being changed into a circle. Number 73. Following the events of Civil War, Steve Rogers was seemingly shot and killed. That left the Marvel Universe without a Captain America, and Tony Stark at one point gave Legolas wannabe Hawkeye the shield and costume. Number 74. Sam Wilson, aka Falcon, and Bucky Barnes have also both taken up the mantle and put on the suit. Thor's probably put it on too, but that's mainly because he likes to play dress up. Number 75. Captain America hasn't always been as pro-American as he appears, and has actually on occasion become jaded with his identity and government, leading him to change his superhero name to Nomad. Ha, <laughs> Nomad, bro. <laughs> Get it? Because, yeah, you, you got it, got it. Number 76. The character appeared in a 1966 animated show called The Marvel Superheroes, which featured a number of comic book characters and ran from September to December. Number 77. The show was popular enough that it spawned a series of trading cards. A box of 24 unopened gum card packs recently sold at auction for $2,200. Number 78. In 1979, a couple of TV movies were released featuring the wing-headed patriot called Captain America Sentinel of Liberty and Captain America 2 Death Too Soon. They were, well, like this. Get the picture. 
Number 79. A film creatively titled Captain America was intended for release in the summer of 1990 to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Captain America's character. Several release dates were announced between 1990 and the winter of 1991, but the film went unreleased for two years before debuting director video in the summer of 1992. Number 80. The film was universally panned and has a whopping 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. Four. Even my 240 minute movie about me making macaroni cheese got more than that. Number 81. Nearly 20 years later in 2011, Marvel Studios then made Captain America the first Avenger. Cap's debut in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Number 82. A number of actors were in the running for the helmeted patriot in the movie, including Scott Porter, Garrett Hedlund, Jensen Ackles and John Krasinski, who'd have probably spent the whole film looking down the lens and sighing. Number 83. When Chris Evans was awarded the role, he turned it down three times before giving in. He claimed his mind was telling him no, but his body, his body was telling him yes. Oh, Clive, for God's sake. It was actually because he had reservations about committing to a period of seven to eight years in the same character. Number 84. Sebastian Stan, AKA Bucky, was also considered for the role, but clearly they said no. Sorry, Bucks. Number 85. Before the first Avenger came out and kicked off Cap-A in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Marvel had very different ideas for him. They were going to make the film a comedy because they weren't sure the audiences would take him seriously. Oh, Cap, don't be sad. I take you seriously, mate. Don't worry. Number 86. John Favreau was their go-to guy to direct this mad Cap. <laughs> See what I did? Comedy movie. But he said, nope and would eventually direct the first two Iron Man movies instead, the traitor. Number 87. To create the skinny little pre-serum Steve, they had to film each scene twice, once with buff and tough Chris Evans, and another with a scrawny actor mimicking Evans' movements. Evans' rugged and, dare I say it, quite lovely face, was then CGI copied and CGI pasted onto the other actor. So thanks, other actor, for being so scrawny. You the real MVP. Number 88. Hayley Atwell touching Chris Evans' booby in this scene was actually improvised. She had never seen him shirtless before that take and was so in awe of his pecs, she gave it just a little tap. Oh, I wish she'd give me a little tap. Oh God, um, sorry Jen, you weren't meant to hear that. Number 89. The first Avenger earned over $370 million worldwide, making it the third highest grossing movie set in World War II, just after Pearly Harbor and Saving Ryan's Privates. Number 90. James Payton, who plays Hitler, also played Hitler in The Monuments Men. He should really fire his agent. Number 91. On April 4th, 2014, winter came early, so to speak. In that the Winter Soldier was released, I mean, not, you know, uh, anything else. Sorry, Buck. Number 92. The story takes place a year after the Avengers in the Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline, as well as after Thor flies about London and Iron Man deals with the drunk Ben Kingsley. Number 93. The film took 76 whole human days to shoot. Number 94. The film had the fake title, Freezer Burn, which sounds like a rubbish indie band's first album, so it clearly kept people away. Number 95. The crew had to shut down a freeway for two weeks to film one of the action sequences in Cleveland, which must have been bloody annoying for the people of Cleveland. Number 96. Joe Russo, one of the directors, was a Marvel fan from a young age. He started collecting comics when he was 10 years old, the little scamp. Number 97. The fight scene in the elevator took seven days to shoot, and now I can't go into an elevator anymore without trying to do this. The people in my apartment block really hate me. Number 98! Directors Anthony and Joe Russo shot alternate shots of Captain America's catch-up list. And what you'll see on screen depends on the country you're watching it in. This one's my personal favourite. Number 99. Chris Evans is arguably the king of the comic book movie, as Cap is his fifth comic book role. He's also played Human Torch in Fantastic Four, Nick Grant in Push, Jake Jensen in The Losers, and Lucas Lee in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Number, Number 100. 100. Troy and Arbit control room. Number 101. Hmm. 
I wonder why Chris Evans is sticking around in this role for so long. That was 101 facts about Captain America, and I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time. If you want more facts like Cap just desperately wants some fondue with Bucky, then click on subscribe right now, Super Soldier. Oh, I wish I was Captain America. Then I can't be, because, as you may have noticed, I'm a British man. Shame. It's a shame. Oh, I could be Captain Britain, though. Although Captain Britain gets his powers from Merlin after he crashed his bike, rather than, you know, Stanley Tucci. So, I need to find Merlin and crash my bike. Then I'll be the greatest hero the world has ever known. Or maybe I'll just have a broken leg. Or maybe two broken legs and a messed up thumb. Hmm. It'd be worth it. Right, I'm off to mount my bike for the future of the Earth then. Salutations!